because we're going to start with a question. Today we're going to start with a question, and the question is this. What is the greatest miracle that God can do here amongst us? What is the greatest miracle that we can see God do? What is it? Why don't you just, you can take 30 seconds. You've got 30 seconds. What is the greatest miracle that God can do? 30 seconds. Write something down. Write it down. Write it down. I mean, it's so interesting because you might say, well, God heals people. I've seen God do radical healings. If you go that route, well, then you might have to say, well, I've seen, you know, somebody raised from the dead. Because that would be the ultimate physical healing. God raising somebody from the dead, you might have to go that route. Maybe there's something else that's on your mind. Maybe there's something else that you're thinking about. Write it down. Ten more seconds. There's one drink of water. All right, we're good. It's interesting because a lot of us are probably going to have a lot of different thoughts that we wrote down on that paper. If we took a poll, we might get thoughts here, thoughts there. But today we're going to look at three miracles. Today we're going to get into the word. If you look up there, we're going to start in Acts chapter 9. We're going to get into three miracles that Peter is a part of, that God is doing amongst the people. We're going to look at these three, and we're going to see out of these three, what's the greatest miracle that God did. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me right up there, Acts chapter 9. We're going to be starting in verse 32. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning, and it says this. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. The narrative here is very interesting because we've been talking about Saul. We've been seeing Saul do these things and he's been accepted by the church. But now we go back, we move from Saul back to Peter. We see Peter, he's going here and there, teaching, building up, encouraging this young church, these believers. Why? Well, you might remember the last command of Jesus to Peter would be in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Jesus is sitting there on the beach. He publicly restores Peter, right? He publicly restores Peter after Peter had denied him three times. He restores him three times. And he gives Peter three commands. Do you remember the three commands that he gives Peter? He says this, feed my lambs. Feed those little ones that are going to be believing in me. And then he gives them two more, tend and feed the sheep. Tend and feed those who are older, more mature in the faith as they follow after me. You're going to have this job of building up and encouraging this young group of believers that are going to believe in me. And that's going to be your job. And so we see Peter fulfills these commands. He goes here and there, wherever the Spirit would lead. He goes building, teaching, encouraging these young group of believers. He comes to Lydia. And there's this man. And he, man, the Lord radically heals this guy, paralyzed for eight years. Aeneas. Can you imagine that? Radical healing that you see in your midst. I mean, I, I went to Nepal. I've seen, I can't remember her name now. Um, the mom of the pastors there. Me too. I mean, me too, right? Me too. This was a woman that was beaten by her husband every day. She lived in the slums next to the river. She had little boys. She had this family, and one day missionaries came, and she had a hunchback, and she could hardly walk. She was beaten so severely. And these missionaries came, and they laid hands on her, and they prayed for her. Lord, would you heal this woman? Need you. She started screaming out, oh my gosh, I'm on fire. I'm, I'm burning. And she, as she's burning, she just straightens up. And all of a sudden, she can... She's no longer hunchback. She's no longer has any physical ailments. She's radically healed. And she says, from this moment on, I'm going to follow the Lord. She follows the Lord. Her two kids that were there, they get out of the slums and they become pastors in the churches. It just blows your mind, the things that the Lord does. Physical healings are amazing. I've seen physical healings. Lord, I'm sitting right there. You've heard my story. I mean, even in many of you guys, we've seen the Lord do amazing things with these frail bodies that we have. You know, we've seen miracles of healing. We've seen the Lord do something, not only maybe in our lives, but in the lives of our families, in the lives that are of those who are close to us. The Lord has healed even some of us. This miracle is amazing. Healing is an amazing miracle of God, and it brings Him glory. But the narrative doesn't stop there because there's been a healing, and now look at what happens. Now there was in Joppa, 
A disciple named Tabitha, which is translated, means Dorcas, she was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose, went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was still with them. But Peter put them all outside, knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand, raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed at Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Here's this woman, Dorcas. She has acts of charity. She's been following and serving the Lord, and she, she passes, dies. The believers sent for Peter. Peter comes. Dorcas is, I mean, can you imagine being there? Dorcas raised life. You know she's dead. I mean, at this point, the body probably doesn't smell that good. She's raised to life. Man, once again, the people in the city, they hear about it. And all of a sudden, these people are like, Jesus is God. People start radically turning to the Lord. Peter is staying there encouraging this young church. Two notable miracles have happened. This is an amazing miracle. I mean, I've never seen anyone that's been raised from the dead. Never. But I've heard of people, you know, they say, these guys are dead, and then all of a sudden they're back. Two notable miracles. And I think it's interesting because we have to look at one thing as we look at these two miracles. They both followed Jesus' example. If you look at the paralytic, I mean, Jesus healed paralytics. It's almost a very similar thing to what Jesus did. If you look at Dorcas, the very words that Peter uses are just like a couple syllables different than the word that Jesus used when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jesus, uh, Peter is following in the example that Jesus set for him. He's going out doing the things that he saw his master doing. It's such an encouragement for us today. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 John 2, 6, is an encouragement. It says this, whoever says he abides in him, abides in Jesus, ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. As we go through life, as we abide in Christ, as we walk through life, we should be walking how Jesus walked. Are we walking how Jesus walked in the world? Peter followed this example. He walked as Jesus walked. He used the same verbs that Jesus used. He used the same language. He did the things that he saw his master do. And he said, okay, well, I'm just going to go in the power of Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, and I'm going to fulfill what he's called me to do. Just like Peter, we need to follow the example of Jesus. We need to live authentically in this culture that we find ourselves in. We need to be authentic Christians. And where does it begin? I've told you guys so many times. Where does authentically following Christ begin? It begins in our homes. We have to authentically follow Christ in our homes if we're going to authentically follow him anywhere else. Because if we don't authentically follow Christ in our homes, that's where we spend the majority of our time Regardless of if you just sleep there, I mean, you still spend the majority of your time in your home, amongst your family and friends. And if you can't authentically follow Christ where you spend the majority of your time, what makes you think that you can authentically follow Christ in those areas where you don't spend the majority of your time? We must authentically follow Christ in our homes. I have to be the husband that God's created me to be. It's not easy, ask my wife, right? I'm not perfect. I fail. And when I fail, I have to ask for forgiveness. And my wife is always like, you always ask for forgiveness in front of the whole church. It's so cute. I don't think there's anything I have to ask for forgiveness for right now, so I'm pretty good. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that I don't fail, guys. I mean, I'm, I'm here before you telling you it's difficult to be an authentic husband at home. It's not easy to authentically follow Christ in your home. Because there's times where I don't know about you, but like, I just want to get in the flesh. I just want to think about me. I want to do what I want to do. But that's not why Christ has put me here. Christ has put me here to be an authentic husband for my wife, to put her needs before my own, to show my wife love as Christ loves the church. I mean, it blows my mind. And then to be an authentic dad. I mean, it's, it's kind of good because I have two sweet little angels that never do anything wrong, right? No? Okay, well, maybe they're not perfect. But I have two amazing daughters, two amazing daughters. And I'm gonna tell you guys, they make it easy for me to be an authentic dad at home. 
Am I so perfect? No. There's times where, man, I know I need to have devotions with them. And I just, no, I'm not going to have devotions. I'm going to go play a video game or do whatever I want to do. I fail. It's so fun, funny because my daughter's there saying, hey, Dad, when are we going to have devotions? <laughs> Come on. We need to follow the example of Jesus. Just like Peter was following the example of Jesus, we need to walk in obedience. And for that to happen outside of this place, for that to happen outside of church, it must be authentically happening in our home. And when it authentically happens in our home, all of a sudden we have a witness for those that we work with. All of a sudden we have this amazing witness to our neighbors and we can talk to them about Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has done something here. We're changed. And now we have this news and this amazing stories to tell the people in our lives of all about God and what he has done. We have to go out filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because there's no way that we can do this in our own strength. And Peter understands this. This is what Stott says about G uh, Peter following Jesus' example. Stott says this, both miracles were performed by the power of Jesus. As Peter knew that he could not overcome disease, he could not overcome death by his own authority or power. Because here's the great thing. When these miracles occurred, the people didn't come rush and bow down to Peter. They didn't come and say, oh, Peter, you're so awesome because you healed an ass. Wow, you're so great. They didn't come bow down to Peter saying, Peter, you just raised Dorcas from the dead. Because they knew it wasn't Peter. This guy couldn't do that. It was Jesus. Because you notice what he says. He says to an ass, Jesus Christ heals you. What happens when he... When the Dorcas is raised to life, he's sitting there praying, seeking the Lord, saying, Lord, what do you want to do in this situation? Do you want to raise this woman from the dead? Okay, I'm going to step out in faith. And the Lord does something absolutely amazing. The people saw the power of Jesus. And that's the amazing thing in our own lives. We get to be a part of what Jesus is doing. Jesus changes things and he uses people. That blows my mind. He uses, I am flawed, and yet he uses me in my family and with my friends. Like, Lord, how do you do that? I don't even, like, if, anyways, we get to be a part of what the Lord is doing. And that's one of the most amazing things about a changed life, being a part of what God is doing, not only in your life, but in the lives of those closest to you and your neighbors, your coworkers, Whoever the Lord brings you into contact with, we get to be a part of it. That is so cool. And so we've seen this amazing healing. We've seen someone raised from the dead. We've seen this progression of miracles from a healing to the dead being raised. Is that the greatest miracle? We're about to go into the probably one of the most pivotal books in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10 might be one of the most pivotal books in the books of Acts. Because here's what it is for me. I've spoken about this before. For me, salvation is the greatest miracle that God can do. Because not only does he bring someone who's dead to life, he changes my life. He gives me a new heart. He's changed me from the inside out. And not only that, he's changed my destiny. Like, I'm no longer going to hell. I'm no longer going under the judgment of God. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with Christ forever. It blows my mind. It was so funny because as I was studying this week, I read Wearsby, and Wearsby agreed with me. No, maybe it's just I'm agreeing with Wearsby. He's been, a while, he's been here a lot longer than me. But this is what Wearsby says. Wears, I wrote this down. This was so, when I read it, I was like, I'm highlighting this. I'm going to put this on my wall somewhere. What is the greatest miracle that God can do for us, Wearsby asks, as we look at Acts chapter 10. What is the greatest miracle? Some would call the healing of the body, looking at Aeneas, the greatest miracle. While others would vote for the raising of the dead, looking at Dorcas, that's the greatest miracle. However, I think, this is Wearsby saying, Wearsby thinks, and I agree, that the greatest miracle of all is the salvation of a lost sinner. Why? Because salvation costs the greatest price. It produces the greatest results and it brings the greatest glory to God. What is the cost of salvation? You guys know. Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus hanging on the cross is the price of salvation. 
Jesus died so that I could have a relationship with him. My most entire, probably in all the verses of the Bible, and I will probably continue to tell you this verse until you guys have it all memorized, and you guys already know what it is, Romans 5, 8, but God, but God, my two favorite words, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, when we were enemies of Christ, God died for me. This guy, he died for me. Well, I was an enemy of God. Well, I was doing things my own way. Well, I was didn't even care a whit about what God was doing. He died for me. He didn't stay dead. He rose again three days later, proving that he was God. He was God in the flesh, that everything he said was true, that we can draw near to God. I can. You can. Anyone can draw near to God. When we believe in God, what happens? Our sins, though there are many, what are they? forgiven. Can you think of any better news in our lives? And not only are our sins forgiven, but we're going to spend eternity with him. Singing his praises. I mean, I love worship. It's one of my favorite things. I just love worshiping the Lord. I love it when in Nepal, the room is so packed with people. I mean, there's a room this size, probably smaller than this, really. And there's like 400 people packed in there. You can feel the heat of that place from 10, 20 feet away. You're walking, you're like, what is that? I not only feel the heat, but I am smelling something that I'm not used to smelling. It's 400 people sweating profusely in a small room. But when those guys start worshiping, it goes nuts. They just want to worship the Lord. They, they got these guys. They, run on the stage, they get flags, and they start waving these flags, and they're, everybody's dancing. It goes crazy. They're just worshiping the Lord. They have this freedom. Man, I want to worship God. Sometimes I think that's a little bit of what heaven's going to be like. Everybody just throwing crowns, like, <laughs> let's worship God. This is awesome. There's no greater result. Salvation has, there's no greater result than a changed life the dead brought to life, then being with Jesus together forever. And then as we walk through life, what happens? God produces fruit in us. We're not striving and working for fruit. God's just producing fruit in our lives. Amazing fruit. Fruit that would have never happened if we weren't following the Lord. He produces it. So what? He gets the glory all the glory goes to God for everything that happens. Blows my mind. And then there's this great thing because he calls us to be salt and light in a lost and hurting world. To preserve and bring light to those who are around us. That's amazing because see, when God starts doing something here, people take notice. When there's an authentic Christian, people take notice and they say, what's going on in that person? What's happening over here? There's something different in you. What is it? And all of a sudden, we have this opportunity to share Jesus with others. We have an opportunity. God gives us opportunity after opportunity to share Jesus with others. And then as we share Jesus, we get to see this miracle happening right in front of us. As people open their hearts to Jesus Christ and their lives are changed and they have this new heart and new desires. They want to follow the Lord. Because, I mean, it's, we have it right here. Jesus is alive. And it doesn't, it doesn't say Eli changes hearts. It doesn't say Brian changes hearts or Marina changes hearts. It says Jesus changes hearts. My words are never going to change anyone. God's word can change anyone. Anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. God's word can change you. And so we need to be faithful in giving out God's word because he's alive and he can change hearts. And as we give out God's word, lives get radically changed. And his life is right, we get to watch it right in front of us like, whoa, this is so cool. How is God doing this? I have no idea. I have no idea. And then the question comes for us, well, has Jesus changed your heart? Because if Jesus hasn't changed your heart, then you need to do business with God. It reminds me of the sinner coming before the Lord. There's the righteous man sitting there saying, I'm so glad, Lord, that I'm not like this guy. This guy is just an evil dude. Lost in sin, so glad I'm not like him, that I'm righteous, I'm pretty cool and great. Thanks, Lord. And what is that sinner doing? You guys remember? Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. It's me, sinner. That guy's right. I've sinned. 
Lord, I'm coming to you so that you would have mercy on me. Could you forgive me of my sins? Could you change me? And Jesus says, who leaves justified? Which one? The one that's repenting. And so that, that's the call for any one of us, that we would come and believe in the Lord and repent. And the great news is, is that Jesus forgives all of our sins. Past, present, future, all sins forgiven. Our destiny has changed. It's absolutely amazing. If Jesus has never changed your heart, you need to do business with God. That's between you and the Lord. Come talk to us, me, Pastor Clay, Pastor Rick, any of the leaders afterwards will be happy to share even more with you. And so we see this in Acts chapter 10. The greatest miracle is about to happen on a grand scale. Greatest miracle is about to happen. People are about to get saved. The Gentiles, salvation is going to go to the Gentiles. That's us. If you're not Jewish in this place, that's you. Salvation is going to you here in chapter 10. That's where salvation is going. It's going to us. And it's so interesting because there's a huge problem. What we don't get from reading this is that there's a gap of time that's happened. Remember, Paul says, that, or Saul says, hey, I've been gone for three years. There's a gap of three years. The gap could have gone even up to 10 years of just the Jews and the Samaritans having salvation. There's a three to 10 year gap here before salvation is going out to the Gentiles. There's a wall that has still been in place between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's this wall of separation. Persecution, remember, broke out. Salvation went to the Samaritans, but salvation still hasn't gone to the Gentiles. Many of the people that have trusted the Lord have still been following the Jewish religious system. Even though they've trusted in the Lord, they still go and offer, they still have sacrifice, they still follow all these different things that are going on. They look on these Gentiles and say, these Gentiles can never come close to God. They can't. They have to become like us. God is going to have to do some work to prepare the Gentile hearts and to prepare really the Jewish hearts for salvation, for him to do his work. And so how is he going to do it? You guys, I mean, this is probably one of the most common stories that all of us know, but we'll read it together. Acts chapter 10. How does he do it? At Caesarea. There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. God first begins to prepare Cornelius. Here's this guy. It's an interesting man. This guy is a man who had been seeking the truth. He'd looked everywhere for the truth. you got to realize, back in Rome, you could find truth anywhere. Paul would walk through, even in Greece and Athens, and say, hey, I see you guys are super religious because you have gods everywhere. You, if you want to find the God, you can just walk down the street and find any old God you want. This man, Cornelius, had walked down the street. He looked for God amongst all those idols. He had probably tried to worship here and there, and then what does he find? It's all empty. Have you ever tried to do things and, on your own and you find out, man, this is just empty? I don't, it's not getting me anywhere. That's what this guy Cornelius was. He's, it's just empty, and so he hears of this God of Israel. And so he goes to this God of Israel, and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to find out about this guy and see what happens. And so he starts to give money, give alms, take care of the needy. And he starts to pray. Lord, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? I'm looking for the truth. If you are the truth, would you reveal yourself to me? Just imagine praying that and all of a sudden there's an angel in front of you. Boom! Whoa, what in the world is going on here? I would be freaked out too. This guy, I mean, this guy is in charge of a hundred men. He's seen battle and he's freaking out. What is going on here? And you might say, well, Eli, this is just something that happened back in that time angels appearing to be like, that doesn't happen now. If you were to say that, you'd be sorely mistaken. Rabbit trail, and I'll stay on this rabbit trail for 30 seconds. 
visions of the Lord, visions of angels are happening today. They're happening in the Middle East. We hear stories all the time of people in the Middle East crying out to God, saying, if you're real, would you reveal yourself? It's an angel or even God himself, Jesus himself, comes and appears to them and says, go to the church. And they go to, they're getting radically saved. And then what happens to those guys? They get radically martyred because they will not renounce Jesus Christ because they've seen a vision. They know it's true. Talk to Pastor Rick about his conversion experience. I'm sure he can share with you his vision. Talk to people in the third world. There's visions of God that are going on in our world. Just because it's not happening with regularity in America does not mean it's not going on in the rest of the world. God is revealing himself. And he, let, me, let me be very clear. This guy wanted to, Cornelius, he wanted the truth. He was crying out to God for the truth. Show me the truth. God answers prayer. If somebody is authentically calling out to God, saying, Lord, show me that you're real, God's going to show them. It might not be in the way that they want. <laughs> you're like, God, show me a... I mean, Cornelius didn't sit there and say, God, show me a vision right now if you're real. No. He said, Lord, are you real? Reveal yourself to me. It's so interesting because the angel doesn't reveal Jesus to Cornelius. He's going to use a man to reveal himself to the, to the Gentiles. But when God, when people cry out authentically, God is going to answer. It might not be in the way that we're looking for, but God answers an authentic cry from people, from us. That blows my mind. So God gives them a command. Go to Joppa. Find this guy, Simon. Find him. Have him come. So what does Cornelius do? Well, this guy's been searching, and now... There's a guy that has the answer. Of course he's going to send somebody. Of course he's going to send two servants and a centurion or a little guard to watch him and he sends those guys down. Go find this guy. That was almost the easy part. But now we get to Peter. How's the Lord going to break down the walls of Peter's heart? This guy's been a Jew for since birth. He's been taught since birth that the Gentiles were wild dogs. That's, that's us. I'm a wild dog. That's, I'm crazy. That's what they thought of us. How is Peter going to overcome some of these thoughts that are going on in his head? What's going to, how is God going to, if I was God, all right, I'm just going to appear to Peter and be like, Peter, listen up. The Gentiles are cool people. You got to go preach the gospel to them. Boom, done. Good thing I'm not God. Because sometimes God just leads us on a path. Sometimes he just leads us on a path so that it's not something that's being forced upon us, but we're coming into that knowledge ourselves and saying, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to do what you call me to do. And so Peter is there. <laughs> How does the, this is not the way I would have got Peter to witness the Gentiles. But this is, this is God. God's plan is always perfect. And so how does he do it the next day? These guys were on their journey. They were approaching the city. Peter went up on the housetop in about the six hours, so it's noon time to pray. He becomes hungry. Well, it's lunch. You know, it's time to eat. It's hungry. So they were preparing food for him. He fell into a trance up there on the rooftop and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheep descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. God gives Peter a vision. I had the picture Bible when I was growing up. This was one of my favorite stories because they had this sheep coming down and Peter's on the roof and in that sheep were all these animals. I love like, all these crazy animals are in this sheep. It was, I mean, you love comic books when you're, when you're a kid. I love that story. Seeing all those animals coming down that Peter would have considered unclean and God's telling them, these aren't unclean, man. Remember all the things I talked to you about. It's not about what you put in your mouth. That doesn't make you unclean, but it what comes out of your heart. That's going to be what defiles you here. He's remembering some of these things. And so he, there's some confusion that's going on. Like, why is the Lord showing me this vision? What does this thing even mean? I mean, have you ever had a confusing command by the Lord? Like, why, Lord? Do the laundry? 
That's the worst piece of advice you've ever given me. Why would I do that? Okay, I'm gonna do it. It was the best thing I could have done. It was the very best thing I could have done. Do the laundry. Because Lorena receives love by acts of service. And so every time I did the laundry, all Lorena heard was, I love you. That's not my idea. That never would have come in my head. I thought it was the dumbest thing, but the Lord, the whole point is this, the Lord knows what he's doing. When he gives us a vision, when he gives us these things, when he gives us a command, he knows what he's doing, even when we're confused. Peter's sitting here confused, like, what in the world are you trying to tell me, God? Look at what it says in verse 17. Now, Peter was inwardly perplexed. What? What, what is this vision? As to what the vision that he had seen might mean. He's just racking his brain. Why would the Lord even give me this vision? This is about the dumbest vision I've ever seen in my life. What's going on? And he's perplexed about this vision. What happens? It's interesting because right at that moment, behold, look at this. The men who were sent by Cornelius, these Gentiles, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate at the very moment this vision ends. Those Gentiles are there at the gate, knocking on the door. Hey, is, is there a Peter here? No. They're knocking on the door. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering this vision, so he's still upstairs on the roof, he's still confused, like, what is going on? The Spirit comes and tells him, Behold, look at this, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, because, for, I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright man, and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. And then from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tells him, hey, I'm going to do something new. I'm doing something and you're going to go with these guys without question. I'm doing something. Does Peter know what he's doing? Peter has no clue as to what's going on yet. Lord, what are you doing? It doesn't matter if we understand what the Lord is doing or not. Peter doesn't know what's going on. He's confused. But what is Peter going to do? He's going to walk in obedience. Because that's what we're called to do. There's many times we don't understand the things that are going on. We might not have the whole picture. But God calls us to walk in obedience. And so that's what we need to do. We need to walk in obedience. Because that's what Jesus is called to do. Peter does it, verse 23, so he invited them to be his guests. Come on in. You guys are Gentiles, but come on in. The next day, he says this, he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. He took men, Jewish men with him. He said, let's go. The Lord has called us to go see what he's going to do down here at Caesarea. They go to Cornelius at Caesarea the following day. They entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them. They, he had called together. Look at this guy. This guy was so excited. Look at what it says. He had called together his relatives and close friends. He said, I've been looking for the truth. I've been looking. The angel said the truth is going to come here tomorrow at noon. Come. Let's be ready to hear the truth. Let's be ready to hear the truth. This man Peter's coming. The angel told me. We've gone and sent from meet me here. Come to my house. His relatives, his friends. Can you imagine this place is packed? All these Gentiles are in here waiting to hear what's going to happen. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. He worshipped them. He's like, oh man, you have all the truth. I'm going to worship you. Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I too am a man. Peter will not receive worship. He will not receive the praise from this man. So I'm just a man just like you. We have the same passions. I mean, I'm just a guy. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons. I mean, he's sitting there talking at the door, and he goes in, and he's like, oh, wow, there's a crowd here. There's many people are gathered. And he said to them, you, you're, I mean, can you imagine me coming in here and saying this? This is Peter. This is his first words to a group of people. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. 
Can you imagine? That's your opening statement. You know, it's really unlawful for me to be in here right now. Just so you guys are aware of that, it's not good. For, you know, do you see the next two words? Those are my two favorite words in the Bible. But God, I have an idea of what should happen. I have, an, I have a plan. I have something that's going to go on here. But God has a different plan. I was lost in sin, but God. But God demonstrated love. But God, I mean, every time you see those two words in your Bible, underline them because God is doing something in that moment. But God is doing something. But God has shown me. Nobody else. God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. He says, hey, it's unlawful for me to be here, but God is doing something. I don't know what God is doing yet, but he's doing something here. He's taken that vision and he's meditated and mulled on that thing for a whole day. And he's come to realize that God maybe isn't really speaking too much about the food, but it's starting to speak to him about people. That before God were the same. Whether you're a Gentile or a Jew or a Samaritan, before God, you're the same. A sinner. All of us have the same condition before God. And now it's interesting because Peter is now becoming maybe even a little bit more confused. What is God going to do here? Everybody at that time that's really become a Christian has been circumcised and is following the law. There's, the Gentiles really haven't come to know the Lord. So what is God, God going to do? Is he going to take this Gentile man and... Are they going to circumcise this guy? And how is this going to work? And okay, now it's just more than one guy. Now I have like 50 guys in here. Are we going to have a big circumcision party? Like, I'm not ready for this. This isn't what I signed up for. I don't want to, like, what is going on? Peter's a little bit like, okay, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here. There's so many questions that must be going through his head. And so what does he do? He asks a question. So when I'm was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them, why you sent for me? Why did you send for me? Why am I, I mean, it's almost like he knows why he's there. It's not like he's asking Cornelius. It's almost like he's asking the Lord, Lord, why am I here? Like, what are you doing, Lord, in this moment? I don't quite understand. And so how does Cornelius respond? Verse 30, and Cornelius said four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house. I was crying out to the Lord at the ninth hour. And behold, as I was crying out to the Lord, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. What is the Lord commanding you to tell us? We just want to know the truth. Give us the truth. We want to hear it. We're ready. What is the Lord commanding you to tell us? I mean, can you put your feet in? Cornelius' shoes there for a second. Can you imagine searching for the truth your entire life? And the Lord has told you this man that has just walked into your home has the truth and he's going to share it with you i would just just share with us brother come on what is it what are you going to share simon peter okay he's going to give a little sermon this is an interesting sermon verse 34 to 43 is his sermon not very long read it with me this is what peter said so peter opened his mouth thinking in his head, what am I going to tell these guys? He says, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That he's going to reveal himself to the world as for the word that was sent to Israel. Because I don't have a word for the Gentiles yet. There was a word that was sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Did you time that? It's probably like a minute, maybe a minute and a half. It's an interesting sermon. As you read that sermon, as I read that sermon, I read that sermon and it almost appears like Peter is, like, what do I tell these guys? Here's these Gentiles, like, what do I tell them? There almost seems to be like no passion in his, in his recounting Jesus Christ. He says, well, you guys know the story. It almost feels like he's talking to America today. Everyone here, I mean, even out in the world, you know the story of Jesus. I mean, you've heard it. So I don't, I mean, you've heard about Jesus, that he lived, he was perfect. He did lots of miracles and he freed lots of people from bondage. You heard that he died, you heard that he rose again. I mean, you've heard the story. And then he says, and I'm a witness. I'm one of the witnesses. He ate and drank with me after he rose from the dead. I was there, I saw him, I, I saw his body. He was real, he really rose. He's God. If you believe in Jesus, your sins will be forgiven. That's what he says. I mean, this sermon right here, you can go through the book of Acts and you can find, I think every other sermon in the book of Acts is a better sermon than this sermon. If you read, if you were to list like the, the best sermons in Acts, I would probably, I would probably look at Acts 17. I love when Paul is sitting there in Athens giving this amazing oratory speech to those guys using the unknown God to preach Jesus Christ. I'm like, that is a sermon, man. I love it. And then I would probably rate this one near the bottom. And as I look at it, I start to realize something. The sermon that Peter preaches is probably one of the greatest sermons that ever happened in the book of Acts. It's literally a one-minute sermon delivered by somebody who's unsure of what's really going on. Am I going to have to circumcise these 50 guys? I mean, what are we going to do here, Lord? I don't even know what, what's going on. He doesn't really know. It's like, you guys know the story. He doesn't really know what to say almost. But here's the thing about Peter in this sermon that on first glance seems to be substandard. He's trusting the Lord completely. He might not know what to say, but he's trusting that God is going to do something. Does he know at this point what God's going to do? Absolutely not. He has no clue what's going to happen in the last couple verses. Zero clue. But he's trusting God completely that God's going to do something with this sermon that he's given. It's a reminder to me it doesn't matter if you're eloquent in speech or if you're simple in speech. Maybe you're having a great day or a bad day or you think you did a great job in that sermon or you get home and on Monday you're like, I, I could have changed all those things in that sermon. You want to know what matters in the sermon? Did you preach Jesus Christ? Was that sermon about Jesus? Did you preach just like Peter does here, that Jesus Christ died and rose again three days later? Did you preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Did you preach that if you believe in Jesus Christ, then your sins will be forgiven? Because that's the greatest need humanity has. Did you preach that in that sermon? Because Peter did. Did you preach the word of God? Peter preached the word of God. And you know when you preach the word of God, what does it say? Isaiah talks about it in Isaiah 55, 11, He's having, He says this, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. God is speaking. This is my word. It shall not return to me empty or void. What will it do? It will accomplish that which I purpose. And it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That when we preach Jesus Christ in His Word, God's going to accomplish His purpose when we preach that. And that's what Peter does. He's simply here. He doesn't know what else to do. He just proclaims Jesus. There's Jesus. You know Him. He died for you. He rose again. I, I'm a witness of it. I've seen it. I, we had a meal together. 
And if you believe that this Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and Savior, he'll forgive your sins. That's, that's what he preaches. He simply proclaims Jesus. And as we give out the word of God, here's the amazing thing. The word of God always does what it needs to do. There's always going to be a response to the word of God, whether that response is positive or negative. There will be a response to Jesus Christ. Either people will receive or they will not receive. And it's so interesting here because as soon as the gospel is given, there's a response. The Holy Spirit interrupts this meeting that Peter is having and does something that only the Holy Spirit can do. Well, Peter was still saying these things. He's still like speaking like, okay, let me, let me speak. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, those that weren't following the law. Oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit is, what is going on? What is going on here? The Holy Spirit is falling on these guys. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declares, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the best kind of interruption you can have. The Holy Spirit shows him, shows up and does something amazing. Have you ever seen it? Maybe when we were all up here, right here, and the Holy Spirit gave Brother Garrett a tongue, and then there was an inter interpretation and a prophecy, and it was just absolutely, the Holy Spirit interrupted that little prayer meeting we had right here. That was awesome to see that happen. I remember there was one time I was preaching, and I had a great plan. I had written out all my notes. I was preaching in Nepal. I had an amazing plan. And as I'm preaching, you can feel the Holy Spirit come in that place. And the Holy Spirit started telling me, Eli, you got to stop your preaching because these youth here need to repent. you got to stop what you're doing and you got to get these youth to repent. You just have to tell them. All you have to say is pray and repent. That's all you have to say. And I'm like, but Lord, look at my notes, man. I got this. I got this, Lord. And I, I stopped. I just stopped. And Joe Mesh is looking at me. Because if you see us in the poll, we're, we're very animated. We're like excited. And we sweat five pounds off every time we preach. Which is why I come back so skinny. Joe Mesh is looking at me and he's like, you like? And I look at Joe Mesh and I say, Joe Mesh, the Spirit just said we gotta stop and we gotta we gotta tell the kids to repent and pray. And he looks at me and this is what he said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. He said, okay, that's what we're gonna do. And he says, the Holy Spirit has just said that there's people in here that are living in sin, that have darkness around them. We need to stop what we're doing right now and you need to repent. You need to cry out to God. Boom. It was like that. All of a sudden, even now I think about it, just the hair stands up on my head because the spirit just moved and all these kids, there's just kids immediately were just crying. Like, oh my God. And in Nepal, it's not like if I told you guys, okay guys, you need to pray right now and repent. This is what you guys would do. <laughs> in Nepal, when you say, you need to pray and repent, this is what happens. And they're all just going wild and crazy. After that message, you guys know the story. Every single person came up to me and said, you know, when you did that, I had a vision. There was chains on me. Next guy comes and says, I was surrounded by darkness. Next guy comes and says, there was a demon here. Next guy comes and saying all these different things, but pretty much it doesn't matter. They were saying the same thing. And when I started to repent, there was a man in white, there was a great light, there was an angel, there was something that came and broke the chains and drove away the darkness, drove away the demon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can fill in all the blanks. It was the same story with just different words. The Holy Spirit, God did something in my life this evening. That is the best kind of interruption ever because my words, all those notes that I had written on that page, they meant absolutely nothing. God wanted to do something. 
had to be yielded in obedience to the Holy Spirit, open to what He wanted to do. We need to be sensitive to what the Spirit is doing. Because God has a plan. All I'm doing is just partnering with God. If I'm thinking I'm here doing my thing, we're all in big trouble. I just want to partner with what God is doing, not only in my life, but in the lives of all of us as individuals and as a church. God's not... It's so interesting because God didn't force me to stop that message. God didn't force Carrick to speak in a tongue. He doesn't force himself on these things. We just walk in obedience. It's all that we're called to do. Walk in obedience to what God is doing. And that's exactly what we see Peter doing. These guys, he walked in obedience. He doesn't know. Maybe I got to circumcise all these guys. Maybe all this. Well, I don't know. I'll just preach Jesus simply. He preaches Jesus simply. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit, boom, falls on that place. These guys believe in Jesus. And they're filled with the Spirit. All that they, I mean, God was opening salvation to us in Acts chapter 10. That's what's happening here. He opened salvation to us. The Gentiles, those that were separated by this wall. He opened it. He didn't put any restriction or condition on these guys. and said, okay, I'm going to open this wall. But before you walk through this door, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow all the laws. You need to do No. He didn't do any of that. He said, I'm just breaking down this wall. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to break it down. And the Holy Spirit falls. And these Jewish people are like, what? These guys. What, what is God doing? They're, the, do you see the word amazed? What is God doing? They're not. They're Gentiles. They're amazed. They weren't expecting this to happen. But the Gentiles, all they did was believe in Jesus Christ. And that's all they needed to do. Believe in Jesus Christ. And I mean, Acts chapter 10 is called the Gentile Pentecost. Because we see that the Holy Spirit fills these guys and does something amazing. Just like the Jews, they're amazed. And Peter, he looks at these guys and he sees the baptism of the Holy Spirit on them. And what does he say? He says, hey, we got to baptize these guys. What does that mean? He says, we got to baptize these guys, identify them with the church and with Jesus Christ. Because they've been filled with the Spirit. Can we hold back water back? We cannot. They have to be identified with the church and with Jesus Christ. I love what Stott says about this moment. He says, Peter was quick. In this time, Peter was quick to draw the inevitable deduction. Since God had accepted these Gentile believers, the church must accept them too by water baptism. The church has to identify with these Gentiles. The wall has to be broken down. God had already baptized them with the Spirit. They, there was nothing else. They were accepted already into the body of Christ. The church had to accept them. And so Peter, he's quick to understand this. We've got to accept these guys. Salvation has gone out to the Gentiles. It's so interesting because Peter accept these, accepts these Gentiles into the church. Because God has accepted them into the church. And so he just partners with what God is doing. Here in Acts chapter 10, it's, this is the moment. The start of something that is, from this point on, is going to sweep across the globe. And it's still continuing today in America, in every country in the world. This is still continuing today that salvation is going forth. Salvation is going to any who believe. Forgiveness of sins is happening across the globe. Like Paul says in Ephesians 2, we were dead. Anyone, everyone was dead. But God, being rich in mercy, with the great love that he loved us, made us alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved. The greatest miracle that God has done is salvation. Changing a life, making the dead man, the dead woman come alive, changing their hearts, changing their destinies. And where does that leave us today? I'd like to leave you with a thought as we finish. As we have the worship team come up, as we're going to sing a song together. If salvation is God's greatest miracle in our lives, then Ephesians 2.10 it's one of the most beautiful statements in the Bible. Ephesians 2.10, for those of you that don't remember, it says, for we are his workmanship. And that, what is that word for you guys that know? Masterpiece. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. As you look around this room here now, as I look at each one of you, you are his masterpiece. 
sitting in this place is a masterpiece. You are created in Christ Jesus to do good in the place where he has put you. You are created to do good in whatever place he's placed you. So, I mean, I remember that women's conference. I think Brene guys went to it. Uh, Bloom where you're planted. Was that it? Might not have been the best conference, but I love the thought that wherever God has planted you, that's where you're to grow and bloom and impact that place where he's put you. Be the masterpiece. That God has prepared events in your life and for you to choose and walk in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit and see the amazing things that God does in and through you. I want you to be encouraged this week. God started something here in Acts chapter 10 over 2,000 years ago. Guess what? He's still on the throne. He's still faithful. He's still working today. He's still performing these great miracles of changing people's lives even today. No matter where you are this morning, whether your things are going great, maybe you're at a place where things are tough right now, be encouraged by this. God's not done yet. You're his masterpiece. He hasn't finished yet. You might not understand. You might be looking at yourself like sometimes I look at myself and say, this is a masterpiece? Well, Lord, you're doing a terrible job. Because I don't even know. Have you seen me? I'm a sinner. God's doing the work in your life. He hasn't finished with me yet. He hasn't finished with you. He's doing something and you might not see it right now. It might not look the way that you think it should look. But he has a plan and his plan is going to be the best plan. We can always trust in him. So this week go out in the power and strength of the Spirit. Continue to be salt and light to those who are near you. Continue to do those things that God has called you to do. Continue to go to the lost and hurting world and see the amazing things that God will do in and through you. And so, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. God, would you continue to use us? Lord, I pray very specifically right now that you would fill each and every one of us here in this place with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would give us the ability to live authentically in our homes, with our wives or kids, grandkids, whatever the case may be. Lord, that you would give us the ability to be witnesses to our neighbors and our coworkers, our friends. Lord, that we would be salt and light in a lost and burning world and that we would see your miracle of salvation continue even today, over 2,000 years later, that you are still working. Lord, that you're not done yet. I thank you for the masterpieces that you're creating here in this place. And Lord, would you continue that work that you began in us until the day we meet you face to face. So we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? We'll sing a song together and I will see you at camp next week.